So to CT or not to CT, we're going to cover pecan chalice and catch algorithm review. It's a busy night in the emergency department and your next patient is triaged. It's a three-year-old with a head injury and vomiting. You walk into the room and you see a healthy and alert three-year-old. The parents tell you that he fell off the bar stool a few hours ago, hitting his forehead. He has a bruise and swelling that's formed and he has vomited once at home. When you examine him, he's alert, he's awake, neuro intact, GCS 15. He vomited once at home, like we said, and he vomits again while you are doing your initial exam. You whip out your cell phone to find the latest and greatest clinical decision rule for pediatric head injury. And then you realize there are just so many of them. And the most popular on your phone appear to be Picarn, Chalice, and Catch. And you wonder, what is the difference and what are all of these different algorithms? So our objectives today is that we're going to review um, some of the epidemiology about pediatric traumatic brain injury or TBI. We are going to identify the risk of radiation to children with using head CT because I know that that always comes into play in most people's minds. And then we're going to define and contrast the three different rules, PCARN, Chalice, and Catch. And then we're gonna apply the algorithms to this case. So you get a little practice doing that and evaluate which one you should use, if any of them, that dun, 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 and why. So epidemiology wise, there is tons of, pediatric, of, of head trauma period and about 500,000 cases of head trauma in kids who are under 14 years old every year in the US. And the good thing about kids is that over 90% of those 500,000 will actually present to the emergency department to get care from you. Uh, about 40% of these um, head injuries are due to falls, about a quarter are due to motor vehicle accidents. And I just want to advocate for a second for everyone to remember that non-accidental trauma or MAT or child abuse is actually the third leading cause of TBI and children zero to four. So please, please, please keep those spidey senses and radar up in children who are young with head injury. It might not have been accidental. For pediatric, pediatric trauma-related deaths, unfortunately about 30% is related to severe pediatric traumatic brain injury. The risk of radiation exposure. So it used to be that the data that we cited for this was all from post-atomic bomb Japan. Um, but we actually do now have some real data on this. This comes from countries with universal healthcare like the UK. And they, it, the data, the novel and modern data gives us a better idea of the real risk of modern CT to a child versus just the risk of radiation itself. So if we think about that, we know that the younger a the age the patient is exposed to the radiation, the worse that radiation is for the patient. We know that radiation is cumulative, so we want to be mindful as we're zapping young children that this is going to affect them for their whole life and that it cu accumulates over their life. Just to give you some numbers, it's about 30 micrograys for one CT head um, at age 10 and about 50 micrograys if a child who's gotten to the age of 15 has had two CAT scans of the head. This corresponds with relative risk increases for leukemia and brain cancer. Um, these cancers are really rare. So this data is really hard. And, and, and the reason I think that it's hard for me is that the cumulative absolute risk is very low. So another, another way to say this is in 10 years after one CAT scan in a child less than 10 years old, this translates to one extra case of leukemia and one extra case of brain cancer in 10,000 head CTs ordered. So the, this makes it hard for parents who are worried about their injured child. And it's hard for us when we're worried about our injured patient, because the risk of radiation is just not something that you can apply to an individual patient. It is applied to a population as a public health measure, kind of like we talked about with our, our, um, with our other clinical decision rules. So yes, the risk of radiation is there and yes, we all need to be mindful of it, but it is hard to apply it on an individual basis and I will leave it at that. 
So the next thing we're going to talk about are the three individual rules that we found, and we'll start with PCARN. So PCARN is different because it has two different algorithms within it, and they are based on age. This is the only CDR that does this age-based algorithm, and it was created in 2009. So your patient does not have clinically significant brain injury as long as you can say no to all of the following is how you use PCARN. This, um, this CDR originated in the US and it's most widely used in the US. It has been externally validated and it often leads providers to, to have a observation period for patients. This can certainly lengthen the stay for our pediatric patients, but it does save on radiation. It's very sensitive. I mean like 100% or as, as close to 100% as most things in the scientific world can be. Um, it can be, typically it can be applied to about 75% of the children that you see with traumatic brain injury. And this is important, right? We don't wanna apply clinical decision rules to inappropriate patient populations. So the inclusion criteria is easy. It's just age under 18 and presenting within 24 hours of injury. The exclusion criteria, there are some. The easy ones are penetrating trauma and like something historically wrong with your brain, seizures, brain tumor, et cetera bleeding disorder, that one kind of makes sense, um, or a Glasgow coma scale of less than 14. So an altered patient, don't use a mild TBI CDR. All of those make sense. The problem one exclusion wise is this idea of trivial injury. And again, just like in other clinical decision rules, when you have a term like that, trivial head trauma might be different things to different people. Um, they do a, a pretty good job of describing it. Essentially, it's like, a red mark, not a laceration, um, or like no swelling, et cetera, on the front of the patient's head, et cetera, et cetera. So trivial head injuries, you should not apply PCARN to. Like I said, it's split between age or it's split by age. So you apply this to children under the age of two and then two and over. And under the age of two, it's, it's, a bunch of different little elements that you need to kind of check off that you're looking for, altered mental status, scalp hematoma, LOC, mechanism, signs of skull fracture. And the sticky one is acting normally per parent. So I think we all have taken care of patients with parents who are very comfortable telling us, yes, my kid is acting normally. I know they hit their head, but they, they seem quite fine now. And then there are some parents who are coming to the emergency department with their injured child is just such a traumatic experience for them, they can't give us that information. And I do think that that does lend itself to us observing a lot more children because we have worried parents that say, no, 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 my, my six month old is not acting right. And, and I have no recourse to that as, as an emergency physician. I just have to trust parents, whether they're freaking out and it's legit and it, or whether they're freaking out and it's not legit. Over the age of two has its own set of criteria. Those are a little bit easier um, to apply and PCARN checks out. This does not miss. This is a CDR that does not miss. Clinically significant to, um, TBI and it does not miss children who need neurosurgery. And it does exceedingly well in younger kids. The specificity, bleh, not great once again. In fact, it's the weakest of the three we're gonna talk about. Chalice is um, the UK version. This was the first one and created in 2006. And the inclusion and exclusion criteria are super easy. Anybody under age 16 who hit their head? No exclusions. So you can apply this broadly to anyone. And I, I think that that makes it super useful. A CT is required if any of the following criteria are met. They split up their criteria based on history, exam, and mechanism. Catch is the third. And these patients are divided up into high risk and medium risk. This is Canada's version. It's the youngest of the three rules. It was created in 2010. And it says a CT is required if any of the following are met. And then the high risk patients, they say, oh, these are patients that might need neurosurge. And the medium risk, it's, oh, these are patients that might have brain injury. The short of it is that they all need a CAT scan right away. This unfortunately has the lowest sensitivity um, and you have to apply all of the criteria. You can't just apply high or just apply medium. Um, the kicker with catch is that you can only apply this CDR to about 25% of children who hit their head. And the reason why are the inclusion criteria. So they're just 
there are a lot of inclusion criteria and, and they're hard to get to. So inclusion criteria, okay, past 24 hours, fine. But witnessed LOC, definite amnesia, witnessed disorientation, I don't, I don't even know how many of the kids that I've taken care of, I could actually say that, that this was, you know, real that I could, that I could say, yeah, I can use this clinical decision rule. So just remember that there are a lot of inclusion criteria if you are trying to use the catch rule. And here's a chart to summarize the three different rules and their sensitivity and specificity. This data is from a head-to-head -head comparison that was done uh, in a population of patients in Australia and New Zealand, so a little different than our patients here in the US and certainly a different healthcare environment. This is from 10 different pediatric emergency department settings, and it was originally published in Lancet in 2017. They then did a secondary analysis. So these folks that did this head-to-head -head trial, they noticed that their rate of CT in children with mild TBI was very low. It was only just over 8%. And they were like, huh, kind of feels like maybe our docs know what they're doing. And they wanted to compare physician judgment to these clinical decision rules. Um, and um, they did that in this secondary analysis that was published a couple, like a year later. And they noticed this, the sensitivity and specificity of physician judgment alone is actually really good. And the only rule that's even more sensitive than physician judgment is PCARN. Um, and, and that is just barely. The authors point out in that secondary analysis that full application of these uh, CDRs in their practice setting with their low CT rate would actually increase their rate of head CT. So if they implemented Chalice and just went by that CDR, that would increase their CT head rate to 22% from 8%. And if they did catch, it would increase it to 30%. And they said if they implemented PCARN religiously, this would cause call for an observation of 40% of their patients. And they imagined that some of those observed patients would end up with a CT order and therefore a higher rate of CT. So there is this idea that maybe we're just actually better than the CDRs for head injury. Um, and um, it's, it's not a crazy one. It's actually kind of a very interesting one. So let's go back to our case of our little boy um, and let's use MD Calc to actually use these clinical decision rules and, and walk you through it. So we'll start with PCARN because that's probably the one you guys know the best and have used. So PCARN split by age. So yes, this kid's older than two. No, he doesn't have signs of altered mental status or basilar skull fracture, but he did vomit. So we get the yes for the history part. And this makes him a recommend observation by PCARN. Next, if we use chalice, again, everybody, you can apply chalice to everybody and anybody who's under the age of 16 and hit their head. So nice, easy inclusion and no exclusion criteria. And the history and the exam and the mechanism, it's, it's a longer CDR, it has more elements to it. But in this case, if we apply them all to our little boy, they are a solid no across the board. And Chalice would tell you this child is low risk for severe TBI, clinically significant TBI, no need to CAT scan this child. And you would send him right home, which is kind of a plus, right, over PCARN where you're stuck watching the kid. And then the catch um, rule, um, if we meet the inclusion criteria, right, because only 25% of people do, but this child does meet the inclusion criteria because of the vomiting. If you're using MD Calc, just that instructions up at the top, there lists your inclusion criteria. Um, very useful. If you notice at the end, they say, we really just recommend that you use PCARN. So um, spoiler alert, that's what I'm going to recommend too. And if we do that for our catch, um, we see that we once again get a low risk patient who doesn't need CT. So in conclusion, where does this all leave us? The three rules did not lead us to scan this patient and PCARN led to an observation period. Um, is physician judgment better than all of these CDRs? Well, it's certainly as good as any CDR. And if you actually use the CDRs religiously, you could end up CTing more people if your gestalt is really good, if your judgment is really good. Um, this has actually been studied with PCARN uh, and its effect on head CT rates. So environments in the emergency departments where there's high CT utilization, the application of PCARN actually helped bring down the CT head rate. 
And in environments where the rate is already low, like the PREDICT trial in Australia and New Zealand, using PCARN did not result in an increased rate of CT head. So it does seem that physicians are quite adept at using PCARN, but using it to augment and not using it to overly scan patients. Can these studies be applied broadly to non-PZDs? I think this is a really important question because it's critical to remember that these CDRs are created and validated and externally validated in pediatric EM settings. They are usually urban, they are usually pediatric emergency departments using specific pediatric emergency medicine faculty. So all of that has to be taken into account because the vast majority of traumatized children actually don't present to those settings. They present to our community and critical access hospitals. Finally, the CDRs are sensitive, it's true, and they do help clinicians not miss clinically significant pediatric head trauma, which is critical because again, I think we find ourselves in these no miss, zero miss situations, and that's the expectation for us clinically. What I would recommend in the end is that PCARN is the most sensitive, and I'd recommend that you use that when you can to the 75% of eligible kids. You can use Chalice to back you up if you can't use PCARN for your kids. And I have no idea what benefit that, chat, that catch would provide. And I would encourage you not to use it. I've definitely drunk the Kool-Aid. I work at a PCARN hospital site. So that is my bias. I would suggest you use your judgment plus PCARN to help us all normalize the care of pediatric head injury patients in an effort to have a zero miss policy for children who present with minor TBI. Thank you so much for your time today, and I hope that this helps the next time you evaluate a child with traumatic brain injury.